Hello there, I am David McEwen from Pharmacology at the University of Liverpool and my talk is going to be on understanding life and death decision mechanisms in human leukaemias. TNF has a multifunctional role inside the body. One cytokine here can actually affect many different cellular processes such as prothrombotic actions, adhesion, cellular translation into other tissues, mitogen activation of cells, hematopoiesis and act as a growth factor or induce other cytokines. So really one TNF cytokine is able to generate many different cellular functions which has underlied my interest over the years. TNF has a major role in a variety of diseases, particularly in rheumatoid arthritis and in Crohn's inflammatory bowel disease, and is important in a variety of other long-term chronic inflammatory disorders. Recent breakthroughs in anti-TNF therapies have allowed the negation of lots of these chronic inflammatory conditions, so agents such as infliximab and adalimumab and etanercept are all able to mop up excess amounts of TNF inside the body, and this allows the reduction of the pathological effects of TNF, and this also allows to maintain the physiological effects of TNF too. TNF is able to activate through its TNF receptors, TNFR1, TNFR2, to induce a variety of signaling pathways inside cells. Some of these pathways are able to induce pro-apoptotic effects, such as caspases, and other pathways are able to induce anti-apoptotic effects, such as NF-kappa-B, as seen here. My interest is in how TNF receptor signaling complexes and how one ligand is able to activate two different types of TNF receptors and these activation processes are able to induce a variety of varied cellular responses. Now, TNF has a unique effect in that in myeloid leukemia cells, if we take cells which have a normal growth curve and these cells, if we take those cells which are in the stationary phase or quiescent phase and we treat these cells with TNF, we see that there is an increase in proliferation of these cells in a concentration-dependent manner. If we take the exact same cells, but these cells being in log growth phase or mitotically active, and we treat with TNF, no longer get proliferation but apoptotic cell death. So therefore we see that there is life and death switching with inside these cells. If we investigate these cells further and we pretreat the cells with nothing, the cells will proliferate as normal. Or if we pretreat these leukemia cells with GMCSF, they will switch their phenotype into a death-responsive mode. Comparing life-responsive modes and a death phenotype, we see that there are differences in the signalling, and one of the differences is that we have sustained and increased basal activation of nuclear factor kappa B, and in the death phenotype, we still get activation of NF kappa B, but it is not as sustained as in the life mode. Now we have investigated a variety of cellular processes. Now we have investigated a variety of modulatory proteins to see how these are changed inside the cells. And one of the important ones we have uncovered is FLIP, which stands for FLIP, which stands for FLICE or caspase 8 inhibitory protein. Now in the life phenotype leukemia cells, we see that there are elevated levels of FLIP. And in the death phenotype leukemia cells, we see that there are still levels of FLIP, but they are much more reduced. If we look at the NF-kappa-B signaling inside these cells and we investigate the basal levels of NF-kappa B comparing the leukemia cells with normal non-cancerous cells, we can see that it is still able to activate 100% activation in both these cells. However, the basal levels of NF-kappa B are much more reduced in normal cells, but in the cancerous cells there is an increased basal activation of NF-kappa B inside these cells, and we believe that FLIP is the answer to this increase in basal activity. So in TNF life death switching, Normally, people study TNF-induced proliferation versus no proliferation, or they can investigate apoptotic cell death, and if you inhibit that, you then receive no death. But in these cells, we're seeing both life and death switching from within the same leukemia cell. And here we hope to try and understand the signaling which controls these life and death decisions in these myeloid cancerous cells. Now, acute myeloid leukemia is a subtype of leukemia which is very much divided into two different subsections. There are a quarter of all patients who are under 60 and fit who receive quite intensive donorubicin cytarabine therapy. However, the majority or three quarters of these patients are over 60 or less fit and they cannot receive intensive chemotherapy. They will receive cytarabine alone and only 20% 
of these patients will respond and there is a six month life expectancy post diagnosis with these patients. So therefore, therefore we need to find new targeted therapies that have lower systemic toxicities to be able to treat the majority of these patients. Now, we investigated chemotherapy resistant acute myeloid leukemia cells, finding that heme oxygenase 1 or heat shock protein 32, as it's also known, has a role in these cells. If we take normal non cancerous cells and we treat with TNF in the presence of an NF kappa B inhibitor, B compound, we see that TNF will induce apoptosis inside these cells. Our acute myeloid leukemia cells, however, will not respond by going through cell death processes in the presence of TNF and an NF-kappa-B inhibitor. And we uncovered that there was an additional role of HO1 or hemoxygenase 1 inside these cells. Whereas if we knocked down with siRNA the hemoxygenase 1 inside the cells, we can then allow the TNF-induced death inside these cells. So therefore, there is a secondary anti-apoptotic mechanism which is coming through inside these leukemia cells. We found that this secondary anti-apoptotic effect in the presence of NF-kappa-B inhibitor was not through the antioxidant response element, which is normally induces hemoxygenase 1 transcription, but is instead through the NF-kappa-B1 site that is present inside these cells, as we can see from deletion experiments. When we perform chip analysis on the promoter site, we find that indeed it is the NF-kappa-B1 site which is binding chiefly P50 NF-kappa-B, but also P65 NF-kappa-B, to allow this secondary induction of HO1 inside the cells. Chemotherapy-resistant acute myeloid leukemia cells have this secondary anti-apoptotic gene expression upon NF-kappa-B inhibition, and this secondary HO1 may be under the control of NRF2 as well as NF-kappa-B. NRF2 binds to its antioxidant response element, or the ARE, inside the cells. Now, NRF2 is normally present inside the cytosol of cells, where it's bound to keep one. It's continuously targeted for degradation through polyubiquitination. And upon activation through a variety of stresses inside the cells, the NRF2 is targeted to translocate into the nucleus, where it binds to the antioxidant response element and induces a range of antioxidant detoxifying genes. Bortezomib or Velcade is able to block proteosomal degradation and bortezomib has been used recently for multiple myeloma but trials with bortezomib have been rather disappointing in acute myeloid leukemia. The reason for this is if we then test the bortezomib sensitivity comparing normal cells, non-cancerous cells, to acute myeloid leukemia cells from cell lines and patient cells, we can classify those into normal, good responding cells and cells which are resistant to bortezomib. And generally, we find that in acute myeloleukemia cells, that if you treat cells normally with bortezomib or knock down NRF2 using an siRNA, as here, we can induce apoptotic cell death. Treatment of cancerous acute myeloleukemia cells or acute myeloleukemia cell lines show a substantial amount of these cells are resistant to bortezomib treatment which is not the case in the non-cancerous cells. If, however, we knock down NRF2 levels using siRNA inside these cells, we see that we are able to then completely reduce the levels of these bortezomib-resistant cells inside acute myeloid leukemia cells. So it therefore seems that NRF2 maintains resistant cell phenotype inside acute myeloid leukemia and multiple myeloma cells. When we compare the basal nuclear levels of NRF2 inside a variety of either control, non-cancerous, acute myeloid leukemia cell lines or our cells from acute myeloid leukemia patients, we see that there is a variety of expression of NRF2 inside these cells which does not correlate to the levels of KEEP1 inside the cells. When we compare the, these varied levels of NRF2 inside the cells, we can see that there is a variety of expressions levels of NRF2 inside the cells and there is also a variety of basal levels of P65 NF-kappa B inside the cells. We also see that the relationship between these two transcription factors is in a one-to-one -one status. Therefore NF-kappa B is able to then induce the expression of NRF2 inside acute myeloid leukemia cells. If we then knock down NRF2 levels inside acute myeloid leukemia cells using a lentiviral construct which has a GFP tag in it, which we can see here, we see that we can get good 
knockdown or silencing of the NRF2 signal inside these acute myeloid leukemia cells from patients, lasting up to around three weeks. If we then compare the knockdown inside these cells, we see that we can get good inhibition of NRF2 levels inside all of these cells, round about to basal one-fold levels. So this lentiviral construct is able to then be used inside human acute myeloid leukemia patient cells to then test the levels and the effectiveness of NRF2 inside these cells. If we then look at these cells and test their chemotherapy sensitivity in a colony forming assay, we see that lower NRF2 cells have much less ability to induce colony formation than cells which have a high NRF2 expression level and that the targeted NRF2 microRNA from the lentivirus will reduce the colony formation of both of these types of cells and improve the sensitivity towards chemotherapy. Also investigating the role of microRNAs in acute myeloid leukemias, we find that using a microRNA array that dexamethasone treatment of multiple myeloma cells is able to induce the expression of various microRNAs inside the cells, particularly MIR34A and MIR125B, and use of our reporter constructs for microRNAs and also experiments in which we We'll use anti-MIRs to target the microRNAs and MIR mimics to then mimic these microRNAs. We find that these microRNAs do have a role inside the sensitivity of the cells where P53 levels can be reduced through these microRNAs and that this will also enhance the chemotherapeutic sensitivity inside these cells. NRF2 is able to regulate microRNAs in a variety of ways inside acute myeloid leukemia cells. So normally, mutation of NRF2 or its regulatory proteins can affect NRF2 levels inside cells. Chemotherapy is also able to induce NRF2 levels inside cells, as is aberrant signaling such as KRAS or NF-kappa-B signaling inside cells to induce NRF2. NRF2 can then be activated and then working through its antioxidant response element induce a variety of cytoprotective genes. But NRF2 is also able to induce a variety of microRNAs inside the cells, which are of interest in the chemotherapy sensitivity of the cells. In the final part of my talk, I'll tell you about some work with Bruton's tyrosine kinase, BTK, inside leukemia cells. BTK is known to act in CLL and lymphomas, acting through the B cell receptor to work through BTK to signal for a variety of signaling proteins and transcription factors inside the cells. Recent work investigating BTK inhibitors, including ibrutinib, which is a BTK inhibitor that has been fast-tracked through the FDA and shows good activity inside certain types of leukemias. We find that BTK is expressed inside acute myeloid leukemia cells and that there is also phosphorylation of the BTK, which tends to be more in acute myeloid leukemia cells compared to non-cancerous controls as we see here. Here we have non-cancerous CD34 positive control cells and we see that the phosphorylation level of BTK inside these cells is elevated in cell lines and cells from acute myeloid leukemia patients. Using other lentiviral constructs which are able to be expressed inside acute myeloid leukemia and multiple myeloma cells, we can knock down the expression of BTK inside these cells similar to the NRF2 shown before and we can test a variety of effects inside these cells. So for example here looking at adhesion of acute myeloid leukemia cells to human bone marrow stromal cells we see that we can get adhesion of acute myeloid leukemia cells to stromal cells however abrutinib is able to reduce this adhesion process and we see this here in a concentration dependent manner. So if we were to then look at the association of abrutinib to BTK in acute myeloid leukemia cells using a probe that is fluorescently labelled abrutinib. We see that we get association with BTK inside acute myeloid leukemia cells from patients or in cell lines which are nanomolar or sub-nanomolar in character which is very similar to that level of specificity seen in B cell cancers. We also find that abrutinib is able to inhibit not only the basal levels of proliferation inside these cells, but also we see if we stimulate the cells with cytokines such as stem cell factor TNF, we are able to then increase proliferation which is also sensitive to abrutinib treatment and inhibition. Therefore, BTK and the effect of abrutinib appears to be useful in acute myeloid leukemias as well as in other B-cell related leukemias such as CLL and 
lymphomas. One of the effects of BTK inhibition that has been shown is that there is bleeding inside patients as a side effect and we find that in platelets from patients we find that inhibition of BTK with ibrutinib will reduce the collagen induced platelet aggregation and also the ADP induced aggregation but not so much through arachidonic acid induced aggregation or thrombin receptor aggregation inside human platelets. Therefore the inhibition of collagen or ADP induced aggregation inside human platelets by ibrutinib appears to underlie the excessive bleeding that is observed as side effects from some patients. TNF receptors are activated by TNF and these will induce the formation of complexes which are able to bind pro-apoptotic caspases to the complex and lead to downstream apoptotic cell death. However, in leukemia cells we find that there are elevated levels of NF-kappa B inside the cells which can induce modulatory proteins such as FLIP, which is able to bind to the TNF receptor complexes, and this bound FLIP is able to prevent the pro-apoptotic signaling inside the cells. This therefore allows the more proliferative nature of the TNF receptor signaling to occur, and we therefore see the more proliferative effects of TNF's nature inside leukemia cells. Agents such as bortezomib are able to induce actions through NRF2 sites and there may also be a role for BTK in a variety of leukemias. We find that myeloid leukemia life death switching is in a balance between NF-kappa B, NRF2 transcription factors and a variety of stimulatory kinases. So in summary, there is interplay between FLIP, NF-kappa B transcription and NRF2 processes inside myeloid leukemias. Expression of modulatory proteins tips the balance to achieve the cell's desired responses. Control of these modulatory proteins may be through microRNA processes and may be useful in anti-apoptotic resistance of the disease. Targeting the NRF2 and antioxidant response elements are useful targets in acute myeloid leukemia and multiple myeloma. And these anti-apoptotic resistance mechanisms are not controlling death processes in normal non-cancerous monocytes or CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells. I'd like to thank all the members of my group and my collaborators and funders to enable me to give this talk. Thank you.